Thank you, President Joffrey, for the welcome. I'd like to inform everyone before we start our lecture that tonight's speaker will be autographing books following the lecture. Hello, uh, as you just heard, my name is Nick Cox, co-chair of the National Affairs Planning Committee. Uh, tonight's speaker, Yvonne Chouinard, is the National Affairs Innovation and Ethics Series keynote speaker. Uh, Yvonne Chouinard is the founder of Chouinard Equipment, which is now known as Black Diamond, and the founder and owner of Patagonia. Mr. Chouinard is also the author of two books, Climbing Ice and Let My People Go Surfing. Despite owning a very successful and very profitable business, Mr. Chouinard has quite a different history than most business owners. Learning how to climb as a member of the Southern Falconry Club, uh, excuse me, the California, Southern California Falconry Club at the age of 14, Mr. Chouinard spent the majority of his youth outdoors, and in particular, climbing. Climbing with a rope stolen from a telephone company, Mr. Chouinard spent 200 plus days out of every year living under the stars, subsisting on a cheap diet of oatmeal, potatoes, squirrel, porcupine, and wholesale dented cat food cans. The last menu item was in fact confirmed to me by Mr. Chouinard when I picked him up at the airport. The life in the out this life in the outdoors defined the way Yvonne and his wife Melinda Chouinard built Patagonia. We often hear about the environmental problems facing us, but as a whole, do little to address these problems. Patagonia is Mr. Chouinard's response to this challenge. It offers environmentally concerned consumers and adventurers alike top-notch clothing made from organic cotton and recycled materials. Uh, I myself own a fleece made from recycled pop bottles, which uh, I often find myself bragging about. As an environmentalist, an outdoor enthusiast, and a Patagoniac, I am pleased to introduce Yvonne Chouinard. Well, I thought I was going to be talking to a couple of classes or something. I didn't know I was going to be in the Great Hall. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for inviting me here. I, uh, I think my climbing career started when I was a baby, before I could walk. Because uh, we lived in Maine, in a little French-Canadian town where nobody spoke English. And uh, we had a priest living upstairs, boarding with us. And he used to entice me to climb up the stairs when I was a little baby, because at the top, it'd give me a spoonful of honey. So I think that's where I learned that uh, there's rewards in high, high places. Um, when I was, uh, we moved to California when I was seven years old, and I couldn't speak English. I was put in uh, public school, and within a few days, I ran away from school. So, uh, that's kind of the, the start of my going in a different direction. I, I think uh, my favorite quote about entrepreneurs is if you want to understand the entrepreneur, study the juvenile delinquent. <laughs> um, um, like, uh, I, I got into falconry when I was about 12 years old, which is, you know, training hawks and falcons to hunt. I mean, they already know how to hunt. It's, you have to train them to hunt for you. And I've been kind of a student of Zen philosophy most of my life. And I think my first lesson in Zen was uh, having to stay up, trapping a, a wild goshawk and uh, having putting them on your hand and having them fly off and you put him back on, he flies off, put him back on. And you do that all night long until finally he falls asleep on your hand. And, uh, and then that's a quick way to build trust. And I think uh, the Zen master would have to say, you know, just who's getting trained here anyway? So I've used lessons in kind of Zen philosophy and business because you know, we don't focus on profits, we focus on the process. If the process is growing well, I know the profits will happen. 
Um, learning to climb to hawks and falcons, I, um, I learned how to climb. And pretty soon I was climbing for its own sake. I was, when I was 16, I took off from California with an old car that I had rebuilt in auto shop class. And I drove to the Wind River Mountains in Wyoming and climbed my first mountain. And so I got in, I got into with some other young climbers and and at, the, at that time, um, all the equipment was made in Europe. And the, the pitons, you know, the spikes that you drive into the cracks into the rock were made out of soft iron because the Europeans had an attitude towards mountains that you conquer them and you leave them, um, you'll put up a route and you leave everything in place to make it easier for the next person. Well, we, we were kind of students of John Muir and Thoreau and Emerson and the American naturist philosophers and we had an attitude that you should climb these mountains and leave no trace of having been there. And the problem was these soft uh, iron pitons were meant to be used only once. If you tried to take them out, the head would break off. And so I decided to make some pitons out of hard steel instead of iron that could be put in and taken out repeatedly. Well, um, I made some for myself. I, I taught myself blacksmithing, bought an anvil and a forge and made a few for myself and then for a few friends, and then friends of friends, and then pretty soon I'm selling these things. I'm making two an hour and I'm selling them for a dollar and a half each. Now, um, you might think that's pretty cheap, <laughs> but uh, at that the European pitons were selling for 15 cents each. So that's 10 times. But it soon proved that uh, we were able to do more difficult rocks, uh, climbs with these pitons. In fact, we were climbing in Yosemite and we were able to do 10 day routes on El Capitan, taking only 30 or 40 of these and using them repeatedly. And pretty soon the world realized that we were doing much harder climbs than existed anywhere in the world with this new equipment. So um, even though I never wanted to be a businessman, I suddenly was in the business of making uh, climbing equipment. So uh, pitons led to making the snap links, the carabiners, and then quite a few other products for rock climbing. And our philosophy of design at the time was from uh, Antoine Saint-Exupéry, which was that perfection is achieved not when you can't any, add anything more to a product, but when you can't take anything away. So we were kind of convinced that simplicity was, was the way. And uh, so the business grew and pretty soon there got to be more and more climbers. I mean, when I started climbing, if you saw a Vibram sole on a trail and you caught up with the person, you knew that person. That's how few climbers there were. But in the 70s, there got to be more and more climbers who were putting in pitons and taking them out. And I started realizing that um, we were destroying the cracks. We were making big holes in the crack. You could tell where a piton had been. And um, that wasn't good. And we were, you know, it was an unintended consequence, which, you know, almost every technology you find has an unintended negative consequence. And that was the one that we discovered. And so we decided to eliminate pitons. We felt uh, we were responsible for this damage, so therefore we had to do something about it. So we developed a method of climbing where we took these little aluminum chocks on a, on a wire and you could just put them in with your finger and take them out with your finger. And they were just as safe and, and actually better 
than using pitons. However, people, climbers that were used to hammering in a, uh, one of these pitons with a big hammer didn't trust them at first, especially the Europeans. And so myself and another friend client did a route on El Capitan with no pitons to prove that you could do this. If you could do a route on El Capitan with no pitons, you could do any route in the world. So we had to lead by example. Well, uh, you know, over the years, we basically redesigned every piece of climbing equipment. I'm not an inventor, I'm an innovator. You know, the difference between invention and in innovation is, invention is um, zero to one. Innovation is one to 1,000. I'm an innovator. I look at a product and I say, I can make this better. But I have to start with an existing product. I'm not very good at imagining something out of the blue than making it. So pretty soon we had 80% of the climbing equipment market worldwide, but we weren't making any money. We were too idealistic. And uh, it was just, you know, we we weren't doing it for the money. We were doing it just for the passion, and and uh, and we were on the cutting edge of climbing. And every time we invented or came up with some better gear, it allowed us to do more difficult climbs. In fact, we redesigned every single piece of ice climbing equipment, and it was so advanced, nobody knew what to do with it. So I had to write a book on how to use it. <laughs> we were that far ahead of the our market. Well, um, I came back from a climbing trip in Scotland one time in the winter, and I had bought a rugby shirt. Now, this, this is when um, active sportswear for men was basically gray sweatpants and sweatshirts. Men did not wear any colorful active clothing. And I brought back this rugby shirt. It had stripes on it blue and yellow and red. And I bought it because I thought it made a really good climbing uh, shirt. It was really tough, had a collar so that the gear sling didn't cut into your neck. And I started wearing it uh, climbing and everyone's coming up to me and say, wow, that's cool. Nobody even knew what rugby was in those days. <laughs> I said, where'd you get that? Wow, that's a cool shirt. Well, the lights came on and uh, so I decided to import a few from Umbro in England and try to sell them, and they sold like crazy. So I brought in more, and pretty soon I'm in the rag business. <laughs> in fact, we created our own fashion. I think those rugby shirts were probably the first colorful thing that men wore. Um, so we. The company, we started bringing in more clothing and um, the company started growing and and one time I saw a friend of mine with a brushed wool sweater and it was real fuzzy and brushed and I thought, wow, that'd, that'd make a great cold weather climbing product if it was made out of maybe synthetic instead of wool so that it didn't absorb water. So my wife um, went down to LA, to the garment district, and went searching for fake fur. And um, she found some, it was a lining of some coats. And, you know, it's the, it's the stuff that your grandmother covered her toilet seat with. <laughs> if, you're, if you've ever seen that. It was really ugly stuff. And we made a jacket out of it, and it worked great. People could fall into a river in the, in the winter and shake it out and all the water would come off and put it back on and would save their lives. And uh, so that was the beginning of the whole fleece thing. So we, we started that. Well, the first pieces were very crude, but then they got better and better. And pretty soon we had a thing called cinchilla, which is now the polar fleece that you see. And it became uh, a fashion item. So we started selling this to non-outdoor people. 
and the sales just took off. We were growing the company 50% a year, year after year. We were strung out financially because you can't grow that quickly on retained earnings without going into deep debt. And sure enough, 1989, there was a recession and all these people that really didn't need a fleece jacket stopped buying them. Well, you know, whenever you're s selling a product that people don't need, they just want, then you're at the mercy of the economy. And that's what happened to us. And uh, that year, we were all ramped up to do 50% increase in sales, and we only did 25 or something. But we had hired people, and we had built up the inventory, and we were so stretched out financially. And then our bank was in the in bad financial shape. They wouldn't lend us any money. It got so bad that my accountant uh, introduced me to some mafia figures <laughs> who wanted to lend me money at 28% interest, which ironically is what you pay for your credit cards these days. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, we had to do some soul searching. I mean, I, we came so close to losing the business and none of us working for me had ever wanted to be in business. And so I decided to take all the top people and we went down to Patagonia, the real Patagonia in South America, and we did a walkabout. We'd walk around for a while and then sit down and then talk about what in the world are we doing? <laughs> Why are we in business? None of us had ever planned to be in business. You know, th this is, you know, we're coming from the 60s here where businessmen were grease balls. And, you know, the industrial military complex was all evil and so was the government. And so we had to sit, we'd sit down in a circle and would say, okay, why are we in business? What are our values? Well, number one, what was the reason we were in business is we wanted to make the best product. We were all passionate outdoor people and we wanted to make the very best product. So that really was our mission statement, was to make the best product. Not among the best, but the very best. And then, um, you know, we didn't want to, we wanted to do it responsibly. So the, the second part of our mission statement is cause no unnecessary harm. It doesn't say cause no harm because there's no such thing as sustainability. There's no such thing as making a product without creating a lot of waste usually more waste than the end product. And, but if you're gonna, if you're gonna be living on this earth, you're gonna be causing damage. But we wanted to minimize that. So we said, cause no unnecessary harm. The other thing, um, we wanted to work with friends. We didn't wanna work with other business people. So we wanted to hire friends. And we wanted to blur the distinction between work and play. So we wanted to work at our play and play at our work. So it was important what type of products we made. And we also wanted to have flex time so that we could go on a three month expedition somewhere and, not, and come back to a job. And we wanted to have the ability to go surfing when the surf comes up, not next Tuesday at two o'clock which is the title of my book, which we have a company policy that says, uh, um, I don't care when you work, I don't care how hard you work, I care about what you produce. That's all. So you figure it out. So uh, that was one of the really important values for us. Uh, And um, we, we realized that we got into this trouble because we were growing the business like every other business, like the you know, unlimited resources, unlimited potential. And we were adding retail stores, we were adding more and more wholesale customers, we were adding more mail order customers and just growing this thing like crazy, like every other American business. 
And we realized that uh, that was wrong. And because we felt that the farmer has a responsibility to leave his farm in better shape than when he received it. Now, when I, I spent a year in Korea in the Army, and I, I saw rice paddies that had been in continuous use for thousands of years. Um, that's as close to sustainability as I've ever heard of. I mean, thousands of years. And so, you know, the forester has a responsibility to leave the forest in good shape, not just to clear cut it. But somehow business is exempt from, from those responsibilities. Businesses, according to the Chicago School of Economics, is you grow it as fast as you possibly can. The sole mandate of a CEO in a public corporation is to maximize profits for the shareholders. You sell stock to widows and retired people at 40 times earnings, and, uh, and you exceed pretty soon, you know, the company exceeds its natural size and it collapses or else gets bailed out by the government. And I didn't want to be part of that kind of a business. I wanted a business that hopefully would be here 100 years from now. Well, that meant controlling our growth. You can't grow 10 or 15% a year. And I, I calculated that had we continued growing at 50% a year in 20 or 30 years would be a, a bazillion dollar company. I mean, I, I put butcher paper around one room at a meeting one time and put a one and zeros. That's how big we're gonna be if you keep, you know, 50% growth is ridiculous. You're just on a suicide course. So we decided to limit our growth to where eventually we would be out of debt, out of the, I didn't ever want to talk to another banker again. So of course we got ourselves out of the trouble and since then uh, things have been going much better. Um, we grow what we call natural growth where when a customer says they just received a catalog from us and they ordered a product and we're sold out already, it means we're not making enough. So we need to make more. We don't advertise on inner city buses so that gang kids will wear our black down jacket instead of a North Face down jacket. In fact, in fact we hardly advertise. We only advertise one half of 1% of sales is our advertising budget. So I came back from that walkabout and straightened the company out. And I sat down with all our employees, 15 at a time, and we talked about our values so that everybody was on the same page, everybody was gonna go in the same direction. Because um, I had very independent employees. In fact, um, n none of us had a business degree. People had degrees in biology and sociology and anthropology and God knows what else. And um, I had a psychologist come and do a study of our company and he said, I gotta tell you, you've got the most independent people I've ever seen in a company. They're so independent, they're unemployable anywhere else. <laughs> he said, they're not team players. So how do you lead people like that? It's, you basically have to lead by example and you have to lead by consensus. They, they have to believe that that's the right direction to go, otherwise they do a passive aggressive <laughs> response. So I basically started teaching these philosophy classes and, and these values and that turned into a book which is it's let my people go surfing. The hardest part of the book, well, first of all, I had to, um, an important part of the book is, is talking about quality because we wanted to make the best product. Well, when I said we're committed to absolutely making the best 
piece of clothing we can make, my head designer said, we can't do that. I said, well, why not? She said, well, the best shirt is a Giorgio Armani hand-woven fabric. The buttons are hand-sewn. Um, they cost three, four hundred dollars. And she says, that's the best shirt there is. And I said, well, what happens if you put it in a washer and a dryer? Oh, you can't do that. It has to be dry clean. I said, that's not very good quality. <laughs> because our customer wants a shirt that they can wash in a pail or in a sink and hang it up and have it dry in uh, a few hours and then get on an airplane with it. Um, so we had to figure out a different criteria for quality than, you know, um, than is normal in the fashion business. The fashion business is pretty much making disposable clothing. In fact, your average product bought in a mall is discarded within 90 days. I didn't want to make products like that. So the next hardest thing was to was to write the environmental responsibility part of the of the book. Um, and I, I, I really didn't quite know where to go with that until uh, one day we opened a store in Boston, our own store. We took an old building and we rebuilt it and, uh, it's, and it was springtime and we brought in all these clothing from, uh, it was mostly sportswear in the springtime. And we opened the store, and within three days, my own employees were saying, hey, we're all getting headaches. We're not feeling good. So I closed the store down, brought in a chemical engineer. He came in and he said, oh, he said, your ventilation system isn't working. It's recycling the same air. It's not bringing in any outside air. And they're getting formaldehyde poisoning. And I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Where's the formaldehyde from? well, all your cotton clothing, you know, it's on cotton clothing. I said, well, what's it doing on cotton clothing? It says 100% cotton. I mean, um, he said, well, an item of clothing that says 100% cotton is on the average only 73% cotton. The rest are chemicals put on to sh keep it from shrinking, keep it from wrinkling. Stabilize the fabric? Well, I had no idea. And that's when I realized I didn't know how to make clothing. I was just like everybody else. I would call a fabric supplier and say, hey, come on by. Bring a big book of fabrics. And you go, oh, yeah, I like this shirt. And give me 10,000 yards of this. I had no idea what I was doing. And... I knew one thing, I didn't want to put formaldehyde on my clothing anymore. Because it's, you know, formaldehyde is that stuff you see in the jar with dead lizards and frogs and stuff. <laughs> and it's, it's deadly, toxic. So that's when we started an uh, environmental assessment. And to, to basically educate ourselves as to what we were doing. And um, I started writing down our environmental philosophy, which kind of comes in five steps. This is a five-step program. Number one is lead and examine life. I think most of the damage done by corporations or by us humans is done unintentionally because we're not thinking about what we're doing. And so we decided to start asking a lot of questions. We, the first question we asked, well, what should we be making clothing out of? What's the best fiber? What's the most damaging fiber? And, of course, we thought, you know, the worst would be synthetics because they're made out of petroleum and things like that. And the best would be 100% pure cotton. But we started having doubts about that. So then we started looking into it, and we found out that the absolute worst thing to be making clothing out of was 100% pure cotton, industrially grown. And that's because 
20-something percent of the world's pesticide and insecticide use is used on cotton fields, which only occupy 3 percent of the world's farmland. And then they use uh, toxic chemicals to defoliate the plant, so the leaves fall off so the mechanical pickers can pick. Um, they used to use arsenic for this. Now they use a chemical similar to Paraquat, which we sprayed on Vietnam to defoliate the country. I went on a tour of the cotton growing area in the Central Valley in California, and I was completely grossed out. We're visiting these fields, talking to farmers. Crop dusters are flying overhead, spraying you. To find out the cancer rate is 10 times normal there. The cotton fields are, they're sterile. There's nothing alive there. There's no bugs, no ants, no birds, no weeds, nothing, just cotton. And, uh, and then there's no outlet to the Central Valley in California. There's no rivers going to the sea. So they, all, the, all the water they put on the crops ends up on the west end of the valley and big ponds. And then they hire uh, guys to sit on lawn chairs with shotguns and cannons to scare the, the waterfowl away because if they land on there and ingest that water, then they have chicks with two beaks and three legs and oh, it's an awful deal. And then we saw millions of acres that have been salinated from so much irrigation. Cotton uses an incredible amount of water and, uh, and these are fields, that'll, you know, millions of acres of fields that'll never grow anything again. So I just said, that's it. I don't want to be in this business if I have to use this product. I mean, uh, think about, let me ask you, do you think a, a company has a responsibility for how it makes its product, right? I'm sure you agree to that. But how about the product itself? Does a company have a responsibility for the product? Let's say, you're, let's say you have one of the best companies in America making the best quality of its type in that product and you're hiring people and giving them good jobs and good benefits. You're one of the most respected companies on the stock market, blah, blah, blah. And you're making landmines. And you never thought about it much, but you go to Cambodia, you go to Vietnam, you go to uh, Afghanistan and you realize landmines kill and maim far more civilians than they do soldiers. So what should you do? You wait till the market says we don't want landmines anymore or should you be proactive and just get out of that business? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? How about tobacco? On the package it says it's guaranteed it'll kill you. <laughs> should you be in the tobacco business? Now I don't want to make you know, tobacco illegal like drugs because we know what that leads to but but I don't want to be in that business. And if you're a stockholder in a tobacco company, you are one of the owners. So think about that. So anyway, um, I, I gave our company 18 months to get out of using any industrially grown cotton. And uh, I put at risk 25% of our sales and um, I knew uh, <laughs> this wasn't an easy thing to pull off because there was no organic cotton around. A few people had tried it and had gave, given up. We had to, in some cases, guarantee loans to the farmers to grow or cotton organically because uh, the banks wouldn't give them loans because the banks are in cahoots with the chemical companies. And, uh, and then we had to find gins that would agree to clean all the toxic cottonseed oil out of their gin before they ran our product through. Then we had to find a spinner who was willing to figure out how to spin, spin it into yarn. And that was tough because our cotton, since we, our organic cotton came in with seeds and stems and and pieces of leaves and, and 
a lot of sticky aphids all over it. So it didn't want to run through the machines very well. So we had to find a, a partner in uh, Thailand, a spinner who was willing to figure out all the problems and um, he finally froze the cotton before he spun it so that it would go through the machines more smoothly. Uh, I mean, it was a nightmare to switch over, but we did. And since that was, I don't know, I don't know when that was, what year it was, about 15 years ago, we haven't used a single piece of non-organically cotton since. But that was just asking one question. <laughs> Start, so what are we going to dye this stuff with? Well, we didn't know if dyes are toxic or not. We just ordered already dyed up fabric. And there's different dyes for polyester than there is for nylon, than there is for cotton, than there is for wool. There were no books to tell us anything about this. We had to keep asking and asking and asking questions. Well, we found out that there was one company that made cotton dyes that were non-toxic, but some colors still were. So now, you know, when you educate yourself, you're left with choices. An uneducated person has no choices in life. So, uh, I mean, this went on and on and on. And how about hemp, you know? Is that a good, well, it turns out hemp is a really good fiber to use for making clothing, but it makes a big difference where it's grown. If it's grown in a cold, wet area, or cold and wet in the winter, they leave the stalks of the hemp out, and the same with flax, it's the same thing. And it rets, it means it's the pith rots away and leaves just the fibers. If you don't get your hemp from that kind of an area, then they have to use toxic chemicals to ret the hemp. Polyester, um, some polyester has, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the chemical, a really, really toxic chemical in it. Some polyester doesn't. So <laughs> you gotta know your polyester supplier. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, leading an exam in life and business can really be a pain in the butt, I can tell you that. Well, after you find out all these things, then you have to do something about it. That's step two. Basically, clean up your own act. And that's what we did. We decided to question every process, everything that we do, and try to um, have a cleaner process. Um, we, we also decided to um, take responsibility for our product forever. In other words, we're not like a computer manufacturer who sells you a computer and then good luck having it fixed, good luck in selling it, good luck, it'll be obsolete in two, three years and there you're stuck with it. We decided that we were gonna take responsibility for our product from birth until birth. So like for our Capilene underwear, if you walk into one of our stores, there's a box and you can take your old worn out Capilene underwear and put it in that box and hopefully you've washed it. <laughs> and we take it back to Japan to a, uh, a partner who's spent $100 million in a recycling polyester plant and they take it down to its original polymer and they make more yarn, polyester yarn from it. And it's 75% more efficient than using, uh, making the polyester from petroleum. So we're doing that with polyester, we're doing that with a type of nylon, nylon six. We're trying to design our jackets, trying to convince a zipper manufacturer to make the zipper out of nylon six instead of nylon 12. Trying to convince the uh, trying to make the entire jacket out of polyester so you can, or nylon six so that you can recycle the whole thing. And um, we are recycling, um, we're gonna be asking our customer to give back any piece of Patagonia. 
uh, first of all, we'll repair anything that needs repairing. And um, we'll help you sell your Patagonia product if you're just tired of it. And when it's finally all worn out, give it back to us and we'll make more product from it. We'll make uh, jeans out of recycled cotton. We'll make uh, a lot of fleece and stuff out of recycled wool. Um, we can re recycle hemp. We're trying to figure out how to do that now. So in other words, uh, just responsibility for our product forever. And then we realized, like I said, there's no such thing as sustainability. So uh, we decided to tax ourselves. I, I believe in taxes, to tell you the truth, as long as they do some good. And we decided to take 1% of our sales and use that as an earth tax, just for being polluters, for using up non-renewable resources. So um, over the years, that's amounted to almost $40 million. Um, and so what does that cost us? It, you know, it seems like it's not 1% of profits, 1% of sales. So whether you're profitable or not that year, you still have to give away 1%. And I don't look at it as charity. Charity is at the end of the year, you've had a good year and you dig in your pockets and you give some away. This is a tax. It's a cost of doing business is what it is. And um, in fact, I started an organization called 1% for the Planet, which we have now 1,500 other companies doing the same thing in 37 countries, all of which um, pledged 1% of their sales to environmental causes. So how much does that cost us? Well, um, it costs us practically nothing because we don't have to advertise. It gives us a great um, uh, our customers really appreciate it. And, uh, and like I said, we hardly have to advertise. What do we do with that money? We support civil democracy. Because I think if you pick up any newspaper on any day of the, of the week, you'll see that any gains we're making as a society, we're making through civil democracy. The government is not going to solve our problems, let me tell you. I mean. Look at the global warming in Copenhagen. Nothing happened. There's more happening with individuals and little towns and counties around this country than ever happened in Copenhagen. So um, we give our monies to about 400 different organizations, all working on environmental causes. And we stick strictly with environmental causes. We can't be dealing in social causes and stuff because it just isn't enough money. In any case, I think most social problems are a symptom. And in a lot of cases, the real problems are an environmental, the real causes are an environmental problem. I mean, for instance, when I wrote my book, I said that one out of eight women was gonna get breast cancer in America. So one out of eight of you in this room. Well, that was about four years ago, and now it's one in seven. You can give money to the Cancer Society. Only 3% of that money is going to go to finding the causes of breast cancer. 97% is going to find cures, because guess why? There's money to be made in cures, isn't there? There's no money to be made if they eliminate the cause. And the causes... Even the Cancer Society now finally admits the causes are not genetic. It has to be something that we're ingesting that's giving us breast cancer. And it could be one of 100,000 chemicals that we have in use today, or it could be a cocktail, of a mixture of those hundreds of chemicals. And so my attitude is, you know, let's stop those chemicals. And so we give to 
organizations that are working on, uh, you know, pesticides and, you know, your average house has 5,000 toxic chemicals in the house. So anyway, that's what we give, that's what we do with our 1%. And then we added a third part of our mission statement, and this is the last step, and that's to influence other companies. I mean, I have all the money I want in life. I never wanted to be a businessman. I spent all my time fishing and surfing anyway. But I stay in business because I'm so pessimistic about the fate of the planet and I feel like all of us need to do what we can because we're the problem. We're consumers, we're not citizens anymore. We're consumers. And the stock market goes up and down according to how confident we are. And you know, if you look in Webster's, the definition of a consumer is one who destroys, one who uses up. That's who we are. So since we're the problem, we're the, also the solution. So for me, the solution is to use the resources I have, which is my company, to do some good. And so the last part of our mission statement is to use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Well, we can't solve the problems by ourselves. We can't wait for the government to solve the problems. We can't wait for our religious leaders to solve our problems, the ones that aren't in jail anyway. Well, we have to do it. And for me, it means digging into my pocket and running this business as responsibly as I can and show that it's good business. Green business is good business. Because the big question in America is if we change over to a a green energy, a green economy, is it gonna bankrupt the whole country? Well, as it is now, we're using up the resources of seven planets. That's not very sustainable, is it? We have to change no matter what. And I can tell you that every time we make a decision in my business that's good for the planet, it makes us more money. So uh, I gave you a lot of am ammunition. So I'm going to open it up to some questions, right? shy people here. <laughs> you just you can just yell them out if you want. Well, uh, yeah, probably the best fabric to be making clothing is hemp. Um, and you can make a very fine shirt uh, out of hemp, uh, some pants that don't wrinkle, and uh, hemp is the strongest fiber there is, and it can be grown without fertilizers, without pesticides. It's, uh, of course, it's illegal to grow it in America because when uh, DuPont invented nylon, they saw hemp as a, uh, as a threat, so they decided to make a law to outlaw it. But it's, it's being grown in Canada, it's being grown in, we get ours from China, which has the highest quality uh, hemp. So it's probably the best. and uh, and. If you use a synthetic like polyester that can be infinitely recycled, yeah, that's good. Okay. We have a mic. Yeah. He wanted to know the energy costs of recycling a polyester jacket and stuff. Well, like I said, it, it only takes 25% of the amount of energy to recycle into, into another jacket than to uh, start from virgin polyester. And um, if you have an attitude that you're going to take back your product 
after the customer's done, you don't want to see that product come back. <laughs> we don't make any money bringing that, taking that product back. So what, you want, what we want to do is make a jacket that'll last forever. We don't want to see it come back. And in fact, we're pretty lucky because most Patagonia products on eBay cost more used than they did new. <laughs> so there's a good, good market for the used stuff. Um, excuse me. You said you want just here. Yeah. <laughs> you said you wanted to work with friends. Do you think there should be a limit to the amount of money someone could earn compared to his employees? There should be a, a limit to the amount of money that that someone could earn. That somebody earns? Yeah. Well, I get pretty grossed out by some of these CEOs of these public corporations, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous how much they make. It's, I mean, how much money does anybody need anyway? <laughs> it's, it's uh, but you know, you can't very well legislate against something like that. Do you feel like 1% is enough? Uh, um, well, you know, it's, uh, You'd be surprised at how much money that is. I, I saw an article in the, in the LA Times a few months ago, and it talked about the great philanthropists in America and how much they really give. Not one of them gives 1% of their annual income. It may be hundreds of millions of dollars, but some of these guys are making $10 million a day. And the biggest philanthropists are the poorest people. You know, some of these Baptists give 10% to their church or Mormons. Uh, most charity comes from the poorest people. And in fact, you know, maybe some of you are thinking, oh yeah, you know, that 1% sounds cool. But when I get rich, I, I'm going to be a philanthropist too. Well, <laughs> if you're a capitalist, a true capitalist, you'll understand that $10 given away right now is worth a lot more than $100 given away 10 years from now. Because that $10 starts working right away. So, you know, philanthropy is a habit. And, and, you know, next time you go get a tank of gas, put 10 cents in the kitty. And after a while, just give it away to a good cause. You start getting into the habit. And you realize that, you know, you have the same thing to eat for breakfast the next day. and. It really, uh, how much money do you need? Question. What particular thinkers have influenced you? And is there a certain process? I mean, you have come up with a personal, a very strong personal ethic. Can you? Tell us if there's a process for that, or something that you do, or a way, uh, something that feeds that. Well, uh, you know, I'm concerned about the health of the planet. I mean, the, the Pew Foundation did a study recently, and they, a poll, and they said saving the planet is number 19th on people's priorities. <laughs> well, if you're, if you're a, a parent or a house housemaker or whatever, you preserve the house, number one. You preserve the family. I mean, saving the planet is number one. There's, David Brower said there's no business to be done on a dead planet. Well, there's no need for symphonies. There's no need for any kind of human endeavor on a dead planet, and that's what we're doing. Um, you just read Collapse, and you'll see Jared Diamond takes case histories of all these societies that have all collapsed. We're doing all the same things. And uh, so, you know, you protect what you love. And for me, having spent, you know, a lifetime in nature, and I'm kind of, you know, my religion is kind of a lot closer to kind of American Indians or, or some of the Oriental re religions that believe that everything is alive, you know. When I climb rocks, I like to think that they're alive. 
I mean, if there's atoms in there flying around, b bumping against each other, and if life is motion, then rocks are alive. Well, it's a harmless thing to believe, you know. I'm not imposing it on anybody. But it makes me think twice about drilling a little hole in there that's going to be permanent. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm influenced, uh, I think, just by knowing that I'm part of nature. I'm not separate from nature. I'm not above nature. Nature isn't here to feed me. That if we destroy our natural world, which we're doing, you know, we're going through the sixth great extinction right now. Um, I don't know how many species a day are going extinct. Well, you know what? The large mammals go first. Well, we're a large mammal. <laughs> Have you thought about that? We're a large mammal. None of us could live very long in, uh, in a refugee camp in uh, Peshawar, let me tell you that, having to drink sewer water. We'd all be dead. So anyway, that's where I get my influence. Just I'm really scared about um, what we're doing to our home planet. Question about um, uh, business models or business leaders that you uh, either drew in inspiration from or that, that you can cite currently that inspire you. No, I, I don't have any. I don't hang. <laughs> I don't hang out with other businessmen. Um, I look at some of these CEOs. I mean, uh, you know, Bill Ford when he was president of. Ford Motor Company was being touted as an environmentalist, and some environmentalist asked him, look, Mr. Ford, if you're an environmentalist, why are you making SUVs? And he said, well, we'll stop making SUVs when the customer tells us to, forgetting that his own grandfather said, um, if you wait for the customer to tell you what to do, you're too late. In fact, he said, if I would have listened to what the customer wanted, the customer didn't want a Model T, he wanted a faster horse. <laughs> so, you know, that, if, you, if you're waiting, waiting for the government to force you to do the right thing, or you're waiting for the customer to tell you to stop making cigarettes or whatever, you're gonna end up bankrupt, or you're gonna need a bailout or something. I mean, the next generation, I mean, Baby boomers and Generation X, we're losers. We're, we're not going to do anything about global warming. I mean, I have lots of friends that went to see Inconvenient Truth, and afterwards I say, well, what'd you think? Oh, my God, that was a fantastic movie. It's, I had no idea things were so serious. Well, did you change your light bulbs? Uh, no. <laughs> we're not going to do anything. But this next generation, Generation Y, some of you young people, you know, 15 to early 20s, they get it. They, they really get it. They, they, they don't watch television, so they still have a brain. <laughs> they, <laughs> they don't listen to advertising. They don't believe in advertising. And uh, they've had enough environmental education. They know what all the problems are. And by God, they're going to do something about it. And you know what? They're going to vote with their, with their dollars. And that's why my business is doing so well right now. I, I'm going through the best year we've ever had in business in this recession. And it's because more and more of these Generation Y are becoming trusted and loyal customers. And if people don't understand that in business, they're going to be left in, in, the, in the cold, I'll tell you. Um, do you? Right here. Do you feel that not in the beginning, not knowing much about business helped you in a sense? Yeah, it did. Um, because uh, I mean, I enjoy part. I, I never wanted to be a businessman, but the most enjoyable part about business is the breaking the rules and making it work. That's the that's really fun. I mean, I, I've always hated authority, and uh, <laughs> that's really the fun part. And and I was able to create a business that we all enjoy going to work at. And, you know, uh, that's a secret of life. I mean, 
If you gave me, I love working with my hands. If you gave me the choice of sitting in front of a computer all day at, as a job or being a dirt farmer growing vegetables, I'd much, much rather be a dirt farmer. Let me tell you. I, 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 hell on earth would be staring at a computer all day for me. Um, for the average consumer, sustainability is a trend. How can we make that a lasting way of life? What, what was that again? For the average consumer, sustainability seems to be a trend. How can we make that a lasting way of life? Oh, boy. I, I think... Uh, I, you know, leading an exam in life is not just a, something that business people can do. I think all of us have to do that. If you want to feed your family healthy food, you can't just go to the supermarket. Some of those vegetables are grown in Mexico where they still use DDT or they come from Morocco or, you know, air freight, strawberries are air freighted from somewhere. You have to know the farmer. You have to, uh, you have to really question everything. You have to know every, what every single ingredient is in that box of Twinkies, you know, 30-something ingredients. What are they? What are those chemicals? So you have to question everything. And, and, uh, and I think um, um, within, a, within a couple years, I've been working with Walmart. I'm talk about influencing other companies. I've been working with Walmart, trying to green their company. And we've been working on a sustainability index for clothing. Patagonia wrote it with uh, Walmart support. And Walmart invited 20 of the largest clothing companies in America to a meeting in New York City uh, just about three weeks ago. And this represented 60% of the American clothing businesses. And we asked them to sign in, sign up to do a sustainability index for clothing so that within two years, you could walk into a clothing store and there'd be five brands of jeans and you can scan the barcode with your cell phone and it'll tell you how that particular pair was made, how sustainably it was made, whether it was made in a sweatshop, whether it was, uh, it's made out of bamboo, which everybody thinks, oh, that's sustainable, bamboo. Well, bamboo is rayon. Rayon is pretty toxic f fiber to be making clothing out of. So we answer all those questions, and there's a rating. There'll be a rating on those jeans. And you can go to the next jean, and there'll be a rating on that one. That'll be in every J.C. Penney store. That'll be in every Kohl's department store. That'll be in the Gap. That'll be in Nike. That'll be, uh, anyway, 20 different co companies. And so that is tremendously powerful, f especially for Generation Y, which is going to demand this. In fact, they just they did a survey, and they realized just, I saw this just, uh, recently, the number of people that felt that they want to buy from responsible uh, companies has gone from 52% in 2008 to 64% uh, in 2000, right now, 2010. That's a huge jump. That's a, so, you know, the, cons we consumers are going to have the last say. In fact, I gave a talk to a bunch of buyers from Walmart, 1,200 buyers one time, and I said, I used to think that designers had all the power in the world because they decide what we're going to drive. They're going to, they decide what our color clothing we're going to wear. They decide what our house is going to look like. But you know what? The buyers have the most power because you don't have to buy any of that stuff. You have the final say. And that they were pretty happy to hear that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think I should just probably end this saying, uh, <laughs> you know, I apologize for maybe, maybe sounding like I have all the, all the answers, but I don't. 
It's just that at Patagonia, we've been asking the questions for a lot longer than most. So thank you for having me here.